Welcome back. So today we start the last unit, electricity and magnetism. And we're going to start off with electricity. Big old lightning bolt. Yeah. Okay, so to understand electricity, you gotta understand the concept of what charge actually is. Okay, you know what the charges come from. We've already talked about this during the first half of this class, chemistry stuff. The charges come from the charged particles of the atom. You know what these are. But in case you've forgotten, the positive one is the proton, and the negative one is the neutron. They go right there. Positive one goes on that line, proton. Negative one goes on that line, electron. Alrighty then. <clears throat> All atoms start off with equal numbers of protons and electrons, so they're all neutrally charged, no charge. All right, even when they bond with each other, the electrons add up, still adding up to the same thing, and so you have neutral compounds. But some substances hold on to their electrons tighter than others. Um, depends on the substance. Examples would be balloons and hair. Balloon is made out of latex rubber. Hair is made out of keratin. Same thing your fingernails and skin are made out of. Um, hair does not hold on to electrons very tightly. Rubber, rubber latex does. So, you rub them together, you can knock some electrons off. You can get one of them to be negatively charged, and the other one to be positively charged. So how does one of them become negatively charged? If you had a balloon rubbing against your hair, we take a comb, rub it against your hair, all right? I'll use my beard here because my top hair is a little too short. Basically, I'm knocking electrons off of my hair. Where are they going to go? Into the, into the um, comb. All right. So the comb now has extra electrons. Electrons have what charge? That's right, negative. So the comb with the extra electrons stuck to it becomes negative. And things will stick to it. Oh, it fell. Anyways, charge doesn't last very long today. It's a very humid day. <clears throat> that means my beard hair became positive. So the comb became negative by gaining electrons. So how does something gain a negative charge? It gains electrons. But for the comb to gain electrons, my beard hair had to lose electrons. So how does something gain a positive charge? By losing electrons. Got it? Good. Protons don't move, by the way. Just get that in your head. Protons do not move. Now, I can define what static electricity is. If you remember from another lesson we talked about static friction, static is a word that means not moving. So static electricity is the accumulation of excess charge on an object. It doesn't go anywhere, it accumulates on one thing, and it stays there. Pause if you need to, because I am moving on. All right, so below that you'll see these pictures. Let me show you the picture right there in the middle. So string and a little ball, and I put a charge, positive, positive, negative, positive, negative, negative. Um, yeah, okay. So this ball is something called a pith ball. Um, pith is one of the layers of tree bark, like cork is. And something about pith is it very easily gains or loses electrons. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to charge up a pith ball. All right, and these strings hanging from the ceiling. So these are two pith balls moving away from each other. These are two that are drawn towards each other. And these are two moving away from each other. Okay, shrink it ink and go back. So objects with opposite charges do this. If you look in the middle there, those two balls are moving towards each other. So objects with opposite charges attract. A T T R A C T. Where do I write it down? Anywhere you want to on those notes. Leave your notes. 
objects with like charges, either two positives or two negatives, repel, R-E-P-E-L, repel each other. They move away from each other. All right. So now you know that. That's going to come up and be very important later on today. Let's move on to the next thing, the law of conservation of charge. It's another conservation law. We've had conservation laws before. All right. So the law of conservation of charge states that charge is neither created nor destroyed, but can be transferred. Rubbing a balloon on your hair, rubbing a comb through your hair or through your beard if you have one. You're not creating electrons. You're not destroying electrons. You're just moving them around. You're transferring. You're rearranging. In fact, you can put the word rearrange instead of transfer, and it will still be a good way of saying this law. All right? Okay, y'all catch up with that. Writing that down while I clean my glasses. Ooh, everything's fuzzy. All righty then. That's better. Next concept about electric charges is an electric field. So I've got some videos attached to this lesson where you're going to see people using electric fields to do some pretty funky things and using materials you can probably find around the house. All right, so you too can play with these experiments. I don't have the means of doing the experiments here in my office for you, so I can't just show you demos like I would be doing all over the classroom right now. Sad, isn't it? All right. Electric field is defined as a field of force surrounding any, elect any electric charge. So if you have a charged object, there's this field of electric force around it that will affect other charged objects and neutral objects if they're small enough. And let's see if I can pick up a piece of paper again. There you go. And it fell. Oop, almost picked it back up again. Yeah, it loses the charge pretty quickly. But I have a little pile of little pieces of yellow paper over there, and I just use the comb, charge it by doing like this with it, and pick them up. See if I can do it one more time, then I'll stop combing my beard in front of you. Uh, I wish you could see it. They're moving, but they're not sticking to it. They're just moving up towards it. Oh well. You saw it once. Okay, so this field of force can be drawn by arrows. The arrows represent the direction a positive charge would move in that field. All right, now, what do positive charges do in positive fields? Two positive charges repel each other. Two opposite charges attract each other. So, below the definition of electric field, there's a little circle with a plus sign, a little circle with a minus sign on your notes. You got big right down here. All right. Which way do the arrows point? When I draw electric fields around them, they're going to look a little something like this. Around the positive one, arrows point out. Around the negative one, arrows point in. The arrows are pointing the way a positive charge would move in that field. All right. Then take some time to draw these two. You can pause it here. I'm going to sip my coffee, but you can pause for longer than that. And then I'm going to move on. Okay. So you've got them drawn. You answered the question at the bottom. Electric fields are represented by arrows. Which way do they point? The direction a positive charge would move in that field. Let's go on to the next slide, which will be a question for you. Which is stronger, electric force or gravitational force? I'm going to try this demo one more time to show you the answer to that question. Now remember, as soon as I take the comb from my beard, the charge starts going away. The air is humid right now. It's um, Monday the 4th. May the 4th be with you, by the way. And it's 5, 10 in the afternoon. And there's pretty decent humidity out there today. Humidity takes the charge off the cone. But look, what's stronger, electric force or gravity? As the charge dissipates, eventually the electric force weakens, but for now, which one's stronger? 
Do I have to say it? Okay, I'll say it. Electric force is stronger. It acts over shorter distances than gravity. That's why gravity is so much more important for the universe. But electric force is stronger than gravity. All right, moving on. Conductors are on the next page now. Conductors are any material in which electrons can move easily. The best conductors in the world are metals. Of the metals, silver is the best. But we don't make our wires in our walls of our houses out of silver. You didn't know there's wires in your walls, right? Some of you are like, well, yeah, of course. Some of you are like, what? Yeah, all your outlets have to have wires going to them from the electric panel in your house. Electric panel is where those switches are that can turn off and on electricity to certain parts of the house. If you have an older house, <coughs> excuse me, you have little fuses that you screw in and screw out. You have to replace them whenever they blow. More on those later. All right, so metals are the best conductors because they barely hold on to their electrons in the first place, especially their valence electrons. Okie dokie. Oh, so um, the wires in your house. I made of copper. Telephone cables used to also be made out of copper. Nowadays they use fiber optics. But um, each one of those little wires was one phone call, one conversation only. This is a piece of the old transatlantic cable used to run across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to North America. I'm oversimplifying that there was a way station in Iceland, but whatever. So, um, yeah, if all of these wires had a conversation, you couldn't call Europe from America, and vice versa. And when somebody hung up. Christmas time, it got full. Okay. Insulators is the opposite of a conductor. Any material through which electrons do not easily move. Good examples of wood, plastic, rubber, glass, air. Basically, these are also good insulators against thermal energy, aren't they? And the transfer of thermal energy. The similarity there somewhere. All right. Now you know that. No, oh, there's a picture of insulators. Basically, the tubing around any wires. Oh, you're charging, so I'm going to unplug you. So, see, this is a wire here going to the speaker. If it was exposed, there'd be just copper right there. But it has insulation around it. And I had to plug that in because I don't think it was finished charging. There we go. All right. No insulator is 100% resistant, and no conductor is 100% conductive. All right. There's better conductors, there's better insulators. There's crappy conductors, there's crappy insulators. It's a it's a range. It's a whole spectrum. Ways to get charged. All right, I got pictures for these. The first one is charging by contact. Second one is charging by induction. Here's a process of charging by contacts. This is what you write there beside the words charging by contact with the colon, above the picture of the balloon guy or the head with the balloon. Charging by contact is the process of transferring a charge by touching or rubbing. So I showed you the rubbing on my beard. If this is already charged and I touched it to something else, that something else would take on a charge too. Electrons would transfer. Electrons go from negative to positive or from neutral to positive because they're drawn to the positive. <clears throat> In fact, you've probably done this at home. Wear suit, wear shoes, or wear no, wear your socks, and walk over the carpet and scrape your feet as you go, especially on a dry winter day. And then go up to your little brother, your little sister, your big brother, your big sister, if you're feeling froggy, your mom or dad, and touch their ear. I dare you. No, I don't dare you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't say Mr. Beeman told you to do that. I didn't tell you to do that. Go ahead and do it. No, don't do it. So. That's how you cause a static shock to somebody with all the electrons that build up in your body transfer at once. But what if you're positive? All the like extra electrons in their body, all the loose electrons in their body transfer to yours if you're positive. Either way, you're both going to feel a shock. You're expecting it, so it doesn't hurt you. They're not expecting it. It surprises the heck out of them. So that's charging by contact. Where does it happen? Where things touch. All right. 
Charging by induction is a little more complicated. If we were in my classroom right now, I'd have a balloon rubbing on my head, and I would stick it to the whiteboard at the front of the room, or to the wall, or to a cabinet, and it would stay. If it had enough charge to fight gravity, it would stay. You see what happened was, well, let me explain. With the picture. Make it big, no, not blue, big. There we go. So you have a negative balloon. That's the negative signs in it. And a neutral wall. A neutral wall has positives and negatives evenly stripped, distributed throughout. It's neutral. There is an electric field around the negative balloon. It's a negative field. It wants no. other electrons that can move away from it will because they're repelled by it. So as this balloon approaches the wall. It pushes loose electrons to the other side of the wall, as far away as they can get from it, and still be in the wall. That makes that little patch right there of the wall positive. Positives and negatives attract, so the balloon sticks to the wall because of electric force. Try this at home if you can, if you have a balloon. All right. Also, don't forget to watch the other videos I have attached to this lesson. Really cool experiments. Okay, let's shrink this down. You're probably wondering, what else can I write about it? Well, the cause of charging by induction. If you want to write this down, you can. If not, um, I'm not going to stop you from not doing that. Caused by electric field of the charged object interacting with the neutral object's charged particles and rearranging them. Pause if you need to, because I'm moving on. I should really turn that phone off when I do this. Okay, electroscopes. I have one in my classroom, but oh well. We're not in my classroom right now. And there it is. Two little leaves inside of here. One of the videos I have shows you a homemade electroscope. If I take any charged object put near this knob, let's say it's negative, it'll push loose electrons down this metal rod to these two aluminum foil leaves and they'll spread out because they'll have the same charge and they'll repel each other. I put a positive object here, it'll draw loose electrons up to the knob, and these two will move apart from each other because now they're both positive. So an electroscope can detect charge. It can't tell you if it's positive or negative, just that there's a charge. If you need to go back and review that by you know, re rewinding the video, go for it. I'm moving on. Grounding. Not the thing your parents probably do to you. The other kind of grounding, attaching something to the earth through a conductor. Why do we do it? We do it because of lightning. Lightning is a huge static discharge. When you go and shock your little brothers and sisters, that's a tiny little spark. Lightning is a two kilometer long spark. It's a lot of charge, a lot of electrons moving all at once. It can do a lot of damage to anything it hits. I don't want it to hit my house. And if it does, I certainly don't want it going through electrical wires in my house. My, it'll mess up my PlayStation, my Xbox, everything. Okay, so why do we have this? The electricity from the lightning bolt will hit a spike, an iron or perfectly steel spike on top of your house. Go through that, through a thick steel cable attached to that that goes around the outside of your house to the ground, instead of going through the wiring of your house. It won't fry everything you have. Not a lot of houses have these things on anymore, these huge spikes on the top, lightning rods they're called. But um, some of the older houses do. If you're driving, or if you're riding around, not if you're driving, if you're driving, watch the road. But if you're riding around, you look around, you see some of the older houses, they have these huge spikes on the top. That's what they have, lightning rods, grounding the home. That's it for this slideshow. See you again next time. Don't forget to watch the other videos. And again, May the 4th be with you.